Hello, and welcome to NetSecOps Habits of Highly Successful Organizations. I'm John Burke, CTO at Nemertes, and joining me today, John Till Johnson, our CEO. This is the second webinar based on our NetSecOps 2024-2025 research study. Uh, please take a look at the previous episodes uh, for a more general overview. Sorry, smack my microphone. Uh, for a more general <laughs> overview of the research and of the results. Uh, and of course, I encourage you to submit any questions that you have to us through the course of the webinar. Don't wait till the end. Uh, just hit the hit the Q and A. Uh, it's a question mark icon on this, I think. Hit the Q and A thing and submit your questions when they occur to you. And let me see. Looks like we got a question now. Yeah, it doesn't look like quite a question. That is it's not a, a question. Okay. Okay, that's not going to help. Um, so, we'll yeah. skip that. We'll skip that one. But uh, if you guys <laughs> if you guys put up the questions, I'll track them, and John can talk. She will do that, and uh, I will be grateful. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, Nemertes is a research-based consulting and advisory firm, and we are focused on the business value that companies realize by deploying emerging technologies. And uh, our focus areas range from the uh, kind of thing we're talking about today, infrastructure and operations, uh, all the way out through you know quantum computing and enterprise AI. So uh, a broad range of things and a, uh, a really fascinating combination of things. Uh, today, we're talking about uh, cybersecurity and network success. So we're gonna define our terms, what do we mean by cybersecurity success, uh, tell you what the more successful folks in cybersecurity do, uh, and then we'll do the same thing on the network side. What do we mean and what are the successful folks doing? And we'll wrap it up with some recommendations. So with that, I will define our core security success metric, which is the median total time to contain an incident. Um, let me explain all these pieces and why they matter. Uh, first of all, when we talk about time to contain, we are not talking about complete remediation of the incident. Essentially, what we're talking about is we've so we found a bug, we see where it is, we slam the ball jar on top of the bug, the bug can't do any further damage. We will now figure out where it came from, what it was trying to do, but we've, we've halted, staunched the bleeding, so to speak. Um, the event can be any event from a phishing attack all the way through some, you know, a, a very in-depth type attack. Uh, that's why we use the median, because if you look at this, this is a very long tail distribution in most cases, because some attacks can last for months or years, and some attacks are over and done within seconds. And so what we do is we break down the time to detect that something is going on. It may not necessarily be an attack, but we notice something anomalous, understand that it is in fact an attack, and then take appropriate measure, measures to contain it. And the median of all of those is what we use as the success metric because it, sh it addresses the fundamental challenge in cybersecurity that <clears throat> everyone's going to get attacked. So there's not really a good way to measure cybersecurity success in terms of whether you get attacked or not or how bad the attack is. It's really how quickly you can respond. So in a sense, a good way to think about the MTTC is that it's your a measure of your cybersecurity immune system health. And uh, what uh, what we saw is that uh, across organizations, that median time to contain uh, varied hugely, and that there was a, an enormous distinction between the uh, the overall median, which was uh, uh, about thirteen hours uh, to contain, and the the very highest performers. And uh, what we saw kind of consistently, though, across companies is that the, the biggest chunk of time goes into that, that middle phase of deciding what to do once you realize there's something you need to do. Um, and uh, that doesn't surprise us, given the increasing complexity of IT environments, the interweaving of on-premises and cloud resources and resources in multiple clouds, uh, and dealing with uh, a workforce that's more often uh, split between on-premises and remote workers. So uh, no surprise that the thinking part is the hardest part. Uh, and how much better are the, the, the very best from everybody else? They are uh, about a thousand times better uh, in that their median time to contain is about 10 minutes uh, versus at the, at the high end of the scale, the folks who are far slower than uh, average, uh, about six days. Um, 
but uh, remember it, it can be subtle and that um, uh, if your automated responses are continually raising the threshold of what requires any kind of human attention at all, uh, you might expect to see this distribution shift towards longer median times to contain uh, before you get your arms back around it. And I'll just weigh in on a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to remind folks to go ahead and, and plug in your questions as mm -hmm. needed. Um, and I will also highlight the fact that over the years we've been tracking this, we've made a few changes in the way we look at things so the and, and how we consider the best. But essentially, the best performers are usually on the order of a handful of minutes. Some years it's as low as two minutes to actually for a median total time to contain. As John says, that's bringing in automation and really responding very quickly. And it also means that you have other layers of fortification ahead of time that are helping you with that decide problem. Because just to put it in very simple terms, what John's saying here is as your environment becomes increasingly complex, determining whether something is anomalous or not gets harder and harder. And then figuring out what you can do about it without shutting everything down or shutting extra things down inadvertently gets harder and harder as well. This is one of the places where AI might actually provide some acceleration in the near future, helping with the decide part. Uh, exactly. But uh, it, it's not there yet. And that's one of the things we'll talk about because the most successful folks in cybersecurity, among other things, um, uh, don't use AI uh, in their operations at the security operations center. In fact, they're half as likely to use AI as everybody else in the group. And that's so, that's the second bullet from the bottom in case you're a little confused. For those playing around at home, yep, I would yeah. jump, in, jump yeah. into the bottom, but I'm going back to the top now. Uh, one of the most important results from the research and contrary to our expectations, uh, all of the folks who are in the most successful group, that 10 minute group, um, they do not have converged network and security operations, no convergence of the teams, no convergence of knock and sock. And um, just, just to jump in on that, essentially what the message is that, and you'll, you'll find that it changes in the knock side of things, but the message here is don't, you know, if you want to maintain extremely high MTT or extremely good MTTC, you don't want it high, you want it low. Right. Um, you do not want to be converging. And that gets back to the whole issue of complexity that we raised earlier, which is, especially for cybersecurity, you want to you want to be able to make these decisions very quickly. And that means simplifying them as much as possible, which means it's easier to do that if you've winnowed out the separated the knock and sock. Uh, again, that's a little counterintuitive because pretty much every vendor is telling you that convergence is the wave of the future. It is ish. But the reason we raise that complexity challenge is if you can address that complexity, we would expect that you could then converge while maintaining a very good median total time to contain. Yeah, I, I take it more as a cautionary note that if you're thinking about converging for other reasons, uh, you're going to have to pay special attention to not tampering with the success of your cybersecurity organization in dealing with uh, emergent events. Um, about half of the folks in the most successful group have a CISO who reports directly to the CEO, uh, not to the CIO or the COO, and that's uh, uh, compared to 0% of the folks in the all others group. Uh, that's a good reporting line for a CISO to have. It's in line with our uh, findings in previous research studies to be associated with being most successful. So a point to take away, if you're in an organization that has not yet defined a CISO position and you're trying to figure out how best to organize, take this into consideration. And before you jump to the next bullet, John, I'm going to hammer on this because this is something Jerry and, <laughs> Jerry and I have spent some time um, looking at. The, there's sort of a broader philosophy here, which is you want the CISO reporting to the either the CEO or someone who is line of business, either peer of CEO or very senior, like COO, um, chief legal person, not the CISO. The, the, the most common reporting structure is CISO to CIO. That's back. No, no. That's basically what we <laughs> want to tell you. And you're looking at us and you're thinking, but that doesn't make any sense because the CISO's job is to protect the IT infrastructure, which is owned by the, the CIO. So that should all fit. I think the main takeaway, and I can't repeat this enough, is that the CISO's main job is to protect the company. It's not just protecting the IT infrastructure because it's not the IT infrastructure that's going to suffer, it's the actual company's productivity that's going to suffer in a successful breach. 
So, I mean, I was just reading, a side note, I was just reading a post by a woman on LinkedIn who had climbed to the pinnacle of success as a doctor. She had this beautiful house. It was fully paid off. And then one of the medical breaches essentially meant that she was she was not earning a dime and was looking to lose that house. And fortunately, the insurance company stepped in and everything turned out okay. But that's the point. The, the breach is not damaging the IT infrastructure so much as it's damaging the lives and livelihoods of the people that work at the company and their customers and everything else. So that's why that line of reporting is so important. And John, I promise I won't be doing this on every single bullet item. <laughs> I, I will have one more thing to say on the next one. In fact, I'll just kind of jump in and jump do that right to it. And I'll hand means. it over to you from there on out. Um, but this is also something we've seen in every single piece of research we've ever done, which is the more you on average, the more you spend on cybersecurity, the more successful you are. Um, 5,000 per head. And by the way, our metric is always not as a percentage of the IT budget. Again, you don't want to peg cybersecurity to IT. That's the fundamental flaw that we're trying to advise you to ignore. You want to peg it to the number of people in the company. So essentially, you normalize it by saying, how much do you spend per capita? And in general, the more you spend, the more successful you are. Obviously, it's possible to spend and waste a lot of money. That's hypothetically possible. But kind of the big picture trajectory is if you are investing in cybersecurity, you will be more secure. And so that's one of the reasons why we at Nemurnies are actually kind of biting our nails a bit because for the first time, more than half of the folks that we interviewed said they were not planning to increase their cybersecurity budgets this year. We think because of AI, that's a terrible mistake, but we can talk about that in a different presentation. So with that, John, I will hand the bullet items back over to you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, one of the ways in which people are spending more on cybersecurity is having a bigger cybersecurity staff uh, and devoted to operations. And uh, the most successful folks are putting four times as many as a percentage of their security team uh, into security operations than everybody else. Everybody else, 15% of security is the operations piece. Uh, the most successful, 60% of security is the operations piece. Um, so that's a huge difference when you're trying to respond to things in, in, in your operations team. Um, and two thirds of them are adding staff in cybersecurity operations in this year and expecting again to add next year. Um, <clears throat> uh, as compared to half of everybody else this year and 0% of everybody else in 25. So a lot of folks are thinking, I'll be done adding my security staff next year. The most successful folks, not, not thinking that at all. Um, they are also substantially more likely to have a security operations team that doesn't wear other hats. That's their job, it's security operations. Um, and that's two thirds of them versus 43% for everybody else. Um, uh, just by the by, uh, half of these folks are also in the most successful networking group, which is important to uh, keep in mind. Sometimes it rubs off. Uh, and <clears throat> they are a third more likely to have a security framework in place. Uh, 100% of the most successful folks have a security framework in place, and they are 133% more likely to be using the MITRE framework as their framework uh, or their primary framework, because sometimes they have a second one. Um, they are 150% more likely to have an external SOC. Uh, that is an important note. 100% of the most successful folks have an external SOC. Uh, versus only 40% of everybody else. Uh, and uh, as a kicker, a third of them also have an internal SOC. And uh, this is worth visiting in a little more detail because, again, this is a piece of advice that we've been giving uh, to larger companies for years, uh, or to smaller companies for years, I'm sorry. Uh, smaller, mid-sized companies should have an external SOC uh, because they won't have the resource pool to draw on to properly staff and um, operate an internal SOC. Larger companies, the, our advice used to be, you should probably insource it, uh, but this kind of result and seeing that uh, uh, larger companies, which make up the bulk of that 33%, who have an internal SOC also, uh, 
are finding reasons to divide the work and have both an internal and an external SOC. Uh, the key to success there being having very clearly defined uh, sets of responsibilities that don't overlap much and clear handoffs between the regimes. Um, we talked about the AI result. Uh, AI use overall is fairly low, only about a third, not even a third, uh, about 30% of companies using AI in their SOC and half that many using it uh, amongst the most successful group. Uh, and mainly that's about the not ready for prime time effect. It's just, it, it's all interesting, it's exciting, it's promising, but it's not quite ready to be part of the operations uh, environment in those organizations. And uh, lastly, wargaming, something that we think is fantastically important uh, in uh, a cybersecurity environment. And our advice is that everybody should be wargaming like quarterly. Uh, and what we find is that in the most successful group, a third of them are wargaming quarterly. And I believe the rest are doing so annually. And uh, actually, John, our advice is wargame as often as possible. Practically yeah. speaking, that's about six times a year. Quarterly is better than once a year. You know, once a year is better than not at all. But um, the most successful companies actually are constantly doing a war game of some sort or other. And moving on, network success. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me take a moment to encourage people to put questions into the questions tab if they haven't already, but questions have occurred to them. Uh, network success. Here, uh, our, our main metric is fairly straightforward. It is the amount of time uh, elapsed between service being interrupted on the network and normal service being restored on the network. So normal for availability and normal for performance. Um, uh, overall, uh, the median time to restore normal services was about an hour. Uh, not about, it was an, it was an hour. Um, and here, the most successful group uh, has set a really, really high bar in that their median time to restore services is zero because they have no outage, no unplanned network outages uh, to remediate. And uh, that's, as I say, a pretty high bar. Uh, for all others, the median downtime is uh, two hours. And uh, that's not bad, but uh, there's a whole lot of better to be, <clears throat> excuse me, so looking at these folks who are most successful in networking, as I said, zero unplanned downtime in the years, the defining characteristics. Uh, now on this side of the fence, we see that two thirds of them have in fact converged networking and security operations versus 25% of everybody else. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this seems to go in line with being streamlined operationally more broadly. Uh, we don't have the correlation in here, but uh, there's also pretty good overlap between folks who are most successful in networking and folks who are highly productive at the corporate level. So a thing to keep in mind, 21% um, more of the network team in operations versus everybody else, not as stark a difference as on the security side, uh, but still noticeably, the folks who are doing best operationally are putting more resources behind operations. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, this is, I, I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but this is a, a fairly prominent thing about this. Uh, none of this group are planning on adding either network team members or network operations team members in this year or next year uh, versus uh, substantial uh, numbers intending to add uh, in the everybody else group. and. Uh, this is kind of indicative of something else that we saw, which was that there's not much in the way of new spending going into the network side of the operation. And overall, this perception that uh, the network is no longer uh, a place to make strategic investments. It, it's a, just a place to keep things running. Um, and, you know, that that may change a little bit as multi-cloud networking becomes perceived as more complicated and important and strategic. Uh, but there's even some question in some organizations as to whether that is uh, in the traditional networking department to deal with in the first place, or is that in a cloud team somewhere? So uh, we're keeping our eye on that space. But right now, it, it looks like we're in one of those plateaus of network involvement 
uh, where everybody thinks the game's over. Um, but we don't think so quite yet. Another indication of that, uh, everybody in this group, uh, their network operations team has other duties than just network operations. So they are also uh, network engineers or network architects or something else. Um, and uh, going to uh, jump down to um, they are more than twice as likely to have converged their knock and sock, an internal knock and sock. Um, and uh, tools is a place where I, there are some interesting differences. Uh, they're twice as likely to be using a network management console of some sort as their primary means of automating network operations versus manual scripting with Python or the like. Uh, we think that's pretty important. A lot of what goes on in network shops uh, is still manual in that folks are writing scripts to do jobs and not using a tool that exists and telling it to do jobs. So these more successful folks are more likely to be using the tools to tell the network what to do than to be writing scripts to tell the network what to do manually. Um, and uh, all of the folks in this group uh, say that they are using the same set of tools in NOC and SOC, and they are three and a half times more likely than everybody else to be even sharing instances of those tools. So if it's DNA center and it's primary to the network side and primary to the security side as well, they're using, of course, the same instance of it, things like that. Uh, we saw plenty of organizations where the tool sets are distinct. And even if they're using the same tools on both sides of the fence, they're running different instances of it, of the tools, um, like Splunk sometimes, they're, they're running different ones. Uh, none of these folks are using AI in their NOC. Uh, overall, we saw that uh, only 15, 16% of organizations were using AI in their NOCs at all. None of the most successful folks are using it. And again, it's that not ready for prime time perception. Uh, even where it's the more straightforward uh, approach, like using it to improve incident filtering, you know, the alert filtering uh, from your uh, SIM systems, uh, even there, none of these folks are doing that. So watching this space intently as the AI tools evolve very rapidly uh, in the current uh, moment. Uh, and lastly, um, folks in the most successful group uh, are not wargaming often enough uh, according to us, because they're only doing it annually, but three quarters of them are doing it annually versus only 50% uh, in the everybody else group. So uh, we have some cause for hope there, uh, but there's still a huge amount of improvement, uh, room for improvement uh, across the board. Oh, and this is back to you, Jonna. Okay. And uh, so I think our recommendations, we did promise to give every, everybody recommendations. They're coming up after these. Okay. So hold tight for those recommendations. I will now put my plug in for episode one, which is uh, something that you can you can view on demand, which is when is NetSecOps not NetSecOps? And that's the overview of the research study that John mentioned. Additionally, I just want to draw your attention to the attachments tab. You'll see that there's links to connect with us on LinkedIn to see that and to see the first part of the series. So please do connect up, uh, say hi on LinkedIn. We do respond. We're highly active on LinkedIn and we love to make new friends. So do reach out. And John, you can just jump to the next slide if you will. Uh, we also have a Nemertis community online for those who are actually qualified. So if you work in enterprise IT and we deem you worthy enough, please join our private online community. Uh, you can hit our website, sign up on the community link there, and we'll review your application. And if we think you're a good fit, we will add you to our vibrant community. One of the things we do is publish our research early there so folks can see that early. We also have online online discussions, a, a series of live events where we actually have people sharing the latest and greatest technology coming out of the labs and coming out of the, you know, cutting edge research vendors. So all very good. We'd love to see you there. And you can just go ahead and fill out that form. Um, so with that, I think, John, we jump back over to you to cover those recommendations. And then if there's any additional questions, I will jump in and answer. So Ask please and answer. bring some questions to us. Uh, our, our number one Takeaway is, of course, to evaluate converging NetOps and SecOps in your organization with special attention to not hurting your security response. Uh, 
leverage your network operations staff to augment your security operations staff. You don't have to go whole hog in merging network operations and security operations, but there's such a huge overlap between that first level response in the NOC and the SOC that you should consider uh, at least overlapping staff in that space. Um, continue to be very cautious about adding AI to your NOC or your SOC and when you start to dip your toe in there, focus on alert filtering. Uh, it's the place with the solidest uh, track record and the longest run up to uh, actual delivery of function. Um, <clears throat> if security is a challenge for your organization, you probably need to spend more on it. And nobody likes to hear that news and it's not surprising to most folks. We're just here to tell you it's true. And uh, lastly, we're, we're not afraid to say war game more uh, because almost none of you are war gaming often enough. Uh, and with that, uh, we will say thank you and throw it open to any last minute question, but I'm not seeing anything new no. coming over the portal here. So I will just note that uh, the replay of this webinar should be up in our channel shortly. If you find this session valuable, please share it with your colleagues and please take a moment to rate the webinar. That helps us uh, shape future content. Thanks very much for joining us today and we look forward to having you join us again soon. Goodbye. And goodbye. <laughs>